Good afternoon, everyone. We'll begin in just one moment. Oh, got the music. <laughs> okay, great. Well, it's my pleasure once again to be able to present the State of the Department Address for the Department of Medicine, otherwise known as Death by PowerPoint or um, hopefully not, um, an opportunity to celebrate with everybody the accomplishments of the Department of Medicine over the last year. As you know, we usually have this lecture as the last grand rounds of the year, but I just thought that the timing was probably not an app appropriate um, for that discussion, but now perhaps the timing is, is even better. So I'd like to begin with um, a discussion of really what is the most precious asset to our department and that's clearly you that's the faculty you are the diamonds that make my coming to work every day um exciting and challenging and give me the opportunity really to watch uh, a family of faculty in a division uh, of a, a department of internal medicine grow and so i'd like to spend a little bit talking about you and the faculty. And the first I want to do is actually congratulate our, our faculty who have been promoted from assistant professor to professor during the last year. Alexander Abreu from Pulmonary, Gary Agarwal from General Medicine, Jose Camargo for Infectious Diseases, Greg Holt in Pulmonary, Medi Mercedes in Pulmonary, Andres Carrion in GI, Tanera Ferreira in Pulmonary Critical Care, Adela Matiazzi in Nephrology, and Justin Watts in Hematology. So congratulations to all of you. This is a major accomplishment, and it's one that really is a recognition of all the things that you do, not just uh, clinical care, but the education uh, aspect that you're involved in, and as well as the research. And in addition, I'd like to really also congratulate our six new professors in the Department of Medicine. This is really the pinnacle, the height. It's sort of like when your kid grows up and they go to college and you really can't control them anymore. Here are six individuals that now have become professors. Professor al Qaidi, congratulations. Professor Ayala, Professor Campos, Professor Lopez, Professor Marcus, and Professor Sussman. Welcome to the group of professors at the University of Miami, an elite group of individuals who have accomplished so much and for whom we're so proud. So a big round of applause to all of you. This is the disadvantage of a Zoom, you know, the, the excitement of hearing the applause. But anyway, you, 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 get the, you get the picture in my excitement for sure. Now, in addition to promotion, uh, we've also hired uh, 38 new faculty to the Department of Medicine this last year, and you can see the different divisions that have hired individuals. Clearly, hospital medicine and pulmonary critical care are at the top because of the large numbers of patients that we have cared for um, in hospital medicine. They went from an average census of about 50 to almost 200. Uh, at the peak, and uh, that required additional uh, people to be hired, and of course our pulmonary critical care. And I'll come back to this uh, more uh, in, in later on in the talk. I'd like to introduce you to some of the newer members of our department. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce you to Naresh Punjabi. He's our new chief of the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine. He received his MD from the University of Chicago, 
and then went to do residency and fellowship in pulmonary critical care at Johns Hopkins. He remained there until approximately two days ago, where there he was professor of medicine at Johns Hopkins, and he's been now here on our faculty for two days. He's had seven R01s and 170 publications. He currently has one R01 and a U34, and he's editor-in-chief of the journal Sleep. He's a leading expert on the role of sleep disorder breathing and metabolic disturbances, and has already developed the internuncial neurons that are necessary for relating many of our divisions and interdepartmental, interdepartmental actions to deal with sleep as it, and pulmonary medicine as it touches on many, many other uh, subject matters. At, that's, at this time, I also want to thank an extraordinary individual, Alejandro Chediak, who had been the interim chief for the last two years. Alex has been an amazing force in uniting a division during a time of transition and certainly during the time of uh, our current pandemic and has really led it in an admirable way uh, and has earned the respect of not only his peers but everybody in the university as well as his national reputation. I'm pleased to say that Alex will remain on as the vice chief for clinical affairs in that division. I also want to introduce you to the new chief who will be coming later this year to Dr. Mikhail Sikeres for the, uh, the Division of Hematology. Mikhail got his MD from the University of Pennsylvania and then went to Harvard for his residency and fellowship. Most recently, he's been a professor of medicine at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio and is director of the leukemia program there. He's a leading expert on the role of genetics in myelodysplastic dysplastic syndrome and its treatment. He's headed over 60 clinical trials, has over 350 publications. And in addition to his prowess as a scientist, he's not only a writer for the New York Times, but you must read his book, When Blood Breaks Down, Life Lessons from Leukemia. This will give you a sense as to what a mensch this guy is. He describes in a very sympathetic, empathetic, educational way, the plight of three patients who have leukemia. Read it, it's really interesting and gives you a bird's eye view of what type of individual Mikkel is. This wouldn't have been possible without our strong partnership with Sylvester, who the year before became uh, an, an NCI designated cancer center. Sylvester and Dr. Stephen Neimer although even though he is in addition a member of our faculty in the department, has truly been a supporter and a friend who has enabled us to bring stars like Mikkel to our department and has supported us not just in oncology, but in many other ways. The symbiotic relationship with the Sylvester Cancer Center has strengthened not only the Sylvester Cancer Center, but also clearly has strengthened the Department of Medicine. And I'm personally indebted to everything that they've done. And anybody who gets a $126 million gift is automatically my best friend. So that, that goes without saying. But I would be remiss not to recognize with significance the outgoing leadership of Dr. Joseph Rosenblatt. He was chief of the division for 19 years. He actually built hematology oncology here at the University of Miami in a way that no one would ever have understood 20 years ago when he came here from the University of Rochester. He's been a major force and is an icon here at the University of Miami. He will remain in the division and the department doing his research and taking care of patients and will always be a trusted colleague and we're grateful that he has turned over the reins now to Dr. Sekaris. We'll just briefly talk at this point about some of the clinical accomplishments that we had and then come back to them towards the end of the talk as well. First of all, the total number of outpatient visits continues to increase as well as the new patient visits compared year to year from FY 18, 19, and 20. The orange bar represents the new patient visits and the blue bar represents the total visits. And you can see that we continue to do well. And this is for the full 12 months of FY20. And you will recall that the last three months of FY20 were during the COVID pandemic when many clinics were closed. And so how could we possibly have maintained our same number of patient visits despite a quarter of the year not having been, uh, is being able to see patients in person? The secret to that 
sauce you'll see uh, in when we talk about our response to COVID. Research has also been quite robust in the department over the last year. The Blue Ridge Institute for Medical Research ranks in departments of in clinical departments of internal medicine yearly based on the number of NIH funding that they have. We are ranked 52, nothing to brag about, not certainly where we want to be, but it's up from the year before from 55. So we went from 55 to 52 with $20 million in NIH grants. And if you were to do per capita, the number of uh, research uh, faculty that we have compared to the top 10 per capita, I think we've done quite well, but we can still do better. And as we recruit people like Dr. Secker and Dr. Punjabi, they will certainly recruit others who will bring more, uh, more funding to the department. If we look at total research expenditures, and that includes both federal and non-federal funding, you can see here over the years how we um, have remained the same. So if we remain the same, how did we go up in the rankings? Well, it just goes to show you everybody's getting this as the same, we call it SURS, has the same problems that we do in terms of trying to get uh, NIH funding, but we've, we've done better than, than, than our peers in terms of getting better. So our NIH grant dollars remain about the same as they have been. And I'd like to acknowledge at this point we have four R01s, new R01s to the department. This is not counting the renewals. And since this was only for FY20, in the last three months, there's been many more grants that have been obtained, and I'll discuss those in a bit. But notice that uh, Dr. al Qaeda has a $15 million R01. That's almost unheard of. I should say Professor al Qaeda, And then you can see the K Award and the R Award and so forth that have been received by Dr. Fernoni and Goldberg and Soleil and Barrow, respectively. So congratulations to all of those individuals who've been recognized by their peers as doing research that's truly uh, translational and impactful. If we look at NIH funding by division, clearly once again, in my over six years here, it seems to be consistent that infectious diseases has the most uh, piece of the pie in terms of the number of uh, dollars by NIH funding. But I anticipate that many of our other divisions will now begin to take off as we have leadership that will uh, push us in that direction. And the leadership even at the top, at the very top of the dean and the CEO and the COO. Education has also been one of our missions, of course, and it's something that we have continued to hold near and dear to us and uh, has been very much a part of our DNA. I'd like to acknowledge our program director in internal medicine programs, uh, Dr. Stephanie Brown, and she's assisted by uh, the associate program directors that you see here. They've done a stellar, stellar job in every way possible and has recruited the very best chief medical residents. You can see the outgoing class on the top and the incoming group on the, on, on the bottom. Please be sure if you see them, say hello to them, welcome them. They are faculty members in our department as well. And uh, they are really responsible for the bulk of the education that goes on, not just in graduate medical education, but also in our clerkships and in our undergraduate medication, uh, education. As far as our residency match is concerned, we've always done well as we have been in our 38 categorical interns. So you can see the numbers there. Um, I'd like to introduce you to a new faculty member, Jonathan Tolentino on the lower right, who will be taking over from Kendra Van Kirk in the role of program director for our Medicine Peds residency, which always does well and is one of the most sought after Med Peds residencies uh, in, in the country in one of the largest. And Jonathan came, joined us from Stony Brook, where he, uh, SUNY Stony Brook, where he was the program director there. And then this is not a billboard on I-95. In fact, although I wouldn't doubt that we would, if uh, we could, we'd put it up there. Uh, would you drive by and coming to work in the morning or going home? Uh, we can see Amar Deshpande, who is almost synonymous with the word next gen MD. Uh, he's put his heart and soul and, you know, 
he also happens to be the vice chair for education in the Department of Medicine, which is another good thing to have. It's always good to have friends that are influential. And truly, Amar has, along with a group of many, many other people that I don't mean to um, uh, miss in, in saying this, but many people worked on this, but we, he really has been at the lead of Empower to Transform, Inspire to Serve, and produce, the goal of this uh, new education program, which you all have heard about, is produce transformational leaders who will shape the future of medicine, direct healthcare systems, and champion discovery and its translation into clinical interventions. And we all were excited at the white coat ceremony when the first group of medical students that will go through the next Gen MD started. And uh, it'll be great to see four years from now how Dr. Despande and his team have really transformed the next generation of physicians. And we're glad to be part of it in the Department of Medicine because most of the individuals that are involved in the teaching come from our ranks. And a special thank you to Dr. Maureen Lowry, who served an admirably 12 years as internal medicine clerkship director and psychologist and mother to all the medical students that have been, been through our clerkship. It, um, she has gone now to become our vice chair for appointments and promotions. And uh, we're glad to see that uh, Mo is, has uh, really dedicated her life essentially to our students and now will de we'll dedicate this, this phase of her life to our uh, faculty in the appointments and promotion phase. So thank you, Mo. And then just a brief word on the finances and how we're doing uh, as with all things considered, I'd like to share with you this, uh, this slide and these numbers. So these are our finances for FY20 that just ended in May. You can see that it's divided into the revenues on the left, expenses, and then the difference between the revenues and expenses. And so if you look, the first column is actual, and then the second one is what we budgeted. And the third is what the difference was, the variance between the actual and the budgeted. So we had about $131 million in revenue in the department. And we had, uh, we had planned to have $141.1 million. Um, recall this is during the, um, which we did not anticipate during the, um, COVID crisis and so forth. And uh, so that, and certain hires that we expected to have didn't necessarily come uh, and uh, because of COVID and so forth and didn't realize all the clinical revenue that we could. So we're about $10 million short of the expected revenues. And our expenses, however, we anticipated that we would spend about 163.8 million, and we ended up spending about 153.2. So it was a 10 million, 10.5 million dollar uh, positive variance in that regard. So at the end of the day, when you add up all the revenues and you take away all the expenses, we end up being in what's what seems to be a deficit of 22.4 million dollars and where it's about only 301,000 uh, from, uh, from our budgeted amount. And as I've been telling you ever since I've gotten here that this is not, I mean, it's all a matter of how you look at the numbers on paper, but a department of medicine of our size and what we do in terms of our missions, it would be expected that we would, should run a deficit of about 26 to $29 million. So, um, and, and really, we hope that next year we won't have to talk like this, that there will be a funds flow model as promised to us by our new CEO, Joe Asheria, that we will have cr been credited appropriately and be able to bank money and to grow for the future rather than being consistently uh, looked at as, as a, a, in a deficit. But overall, I think this is this is relatively good news and is really a testament to you. It's your hard work. The revenues weren't gotten by me. Well, maybe a couple dollars, but not much. And, but most of this is done by you all. And in addition to that, there's been philanthropy and that is never to be underestimated. 
Um, you can see from this list of 5.2 million approximately of philanthropic dollars that came in, it's really from very few people or certain divisions that are more common than others. And so uh, as far as GI and nephrology, they seem to do very good and of late cardiology as well. I urge all of you to think of opportunities in philanthropy that you can use to explore that will help even build greater our department and and uh, help us in our mission. Another thing that became very obvious to us during this past year is the need for us to embrace racial justice in the Department of Medicine and to actually do this in a real tangible way. Here are some numbers that I'll share with you over the last four years in terms of how we're doing in, in terms of our faculty uh, and their uh, racial backgrounds. As you can see, we hover around 6% Black or African, self-described African or American, about 12% Asian or Pacific Islander, and about 30% Latino. Uh, and the numbers of unknowns seem to be going up and the number of white seem to be going down. This is not where we wanna be. This is not what is acceptable. This is something that we must change, but it's not just a simple switch that needs to be turned on. It's a whole mindset and really gets to the basis of racial justice within our department. I don't care about other departments. Yes, they, they are also not doing well nationally and locally, but I'm, my, what I keeps me up at night is worrying about how we're going to affect this change in the Department of Medicine. I read a very interesting book recently, which I urge you all to read. It's on the best seller list of the New York Times book review, and it's called How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibrahim Kendi. Being an anti-racist, he says, requires persistent self-awareness, constant self-criticism, and regular self-examination. Well, to that end, and I'm not saying that's the extent of that we've done all of that. You will recall that we were probably the first department at the University of Miami in response to the George Floyd killing to have a dedicated grand rounds to, um, anti to being anti-racist. And part of the homework from that grand rounds was that I asked all of you to submit to me a real action that you will do that will not just talk about getting rid of racism, but something that will actually be, 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 be re realistic and get rid of racism. Let me just read this. this is not, okay, so here are some, I left it anonymous, um, and I couldn't include everybody because we had really a wonderful um, response to this uh, homework assignment. So let me just read you some of them because I think they're inspiring in their own way. I will be more rigorous in my research of local elected officials prior to voting. Now having a clearer understanding of the impact of those officials on local policing and criminal justice. Another said, calling out colleagues when I witness discriminatory comments or actions rather than letting them slide. Invest in a good social history when I admit patients the first time I meet them to better understand their context being to build trust right away and develop plans in light of their situation. Keep myself and others accountable. Like I have heard these past few days, it is not enough to be a racist, but we, I mean, not enough not to be racist, but we must be anti-racist, as if that person already had read that book. My resolution to really ensure that I'm enforcing the highest standard of care for these patients. I will do my best to encourage more African-American students to be admitted to the Miller School of Medicine as a member of the admissions committee. These are all wonderful, and there are many more like this. Acting on these pledges will truly make a difference and move the needle. Say no to racism. In addition to that, the dean, sorry, the dean has, um, formed a committee, the, the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine, Racial Justice Committee, with, very, with multiple subcommittees. Here you see a list of all the individuals from the Department of Medicine 
who have volunteered to serve on the various subcommittees. The individuals highlighted in yellow indicate that they've taken on the responsibility to chair these subcommittees. I urge all of you, it's not too late to sign up. You can write to me or the Dean, Dean Ford, and he'd be happy to accommodate you on any of these committees. The ac activities are ongoing right now, and there hopefully will be uh, action taken uh, before the end of the calendar year. So at this point, I'd like to come to the uh, part of the talk where we talk about the resiliency and the beauty of the faculty in the Department of Medicine. Reminding me of a quote by Albert Einstein that in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. So what, what possibly good can come out of the, the pandemic? How could the COVID-19 pandemic make the Department of Medicine stronger? I'd like to present to you that in three areas, at least, we have shown the strength of making our department better as a result of the pandemic, whether it's clinical operations, research, or education. When it comes to clinical operations, take a look at this data for just a second. You'll see a bar graph of the total number of visits seen in our clinics in March prior to the pandemic, then in April, and then in May. And the orange line represents the number of telehealth visits. So of the telehealth visits that we had over about, uh, rather total visits of about 16,000 that we had in March, 11% were telehealth visits. We were just putting our toes in the water. We were just dabbling. But in April, when push came to shove, this faculty showed its ability to be truly resilient, stepped up to the plate, Zoom wasn't working, we didn't know where to find the, how to put the meds in, all of a sudden there was no nurse to do the past medical history, but we, may, we exceeded in April and in May our baseline of the total number of visits by ramping up our telemedicine visits to 91% in April. It dropped a little bit in May, but nonetheless, it remained quite high. And this has been sustained even in June, July, and this previous month, August, where you can see we've maintained about 60% of our total visits remain telehealth. Telehealth is really a testament to you and, the, and, your, and your tenacity and, and wanting to help our patients, avoided their ability, avoided them from having to come in person to clinic that wasn't always convenient for them, but maintaining our, our patient volume. And that really has made a major difference and a major impact. If we look at what the Department of Medicine contributed compared to other departments, if you take all the telehealth visits that took place across U Health in FY 2020, medicine accounts for 45% of all telehealth visits in the enterprise. And I can't help but acknowledge Janet Yearn, who, if you don't know, has at least behind the scenes been essential for our fast and rapid response to telehealth. Is it perfect? No. Can we do better? Of course. But uh, we thank Janet very much for everything that she's done. Well, how do patients feel about telehealth? Well, what's interesting is these are the press gainy scores, and these are, are, we're in purple and green, um, and it's uh, our comparison for FY20. The green is FY20 um, before COVID, and purple is FY20 after, during COVID. And you can see compared to all sites in Press Ganey that our uh, likelihood to recommend box, what they call it, has actually increased rather than decreased. So patient satisfaction, despite all the problems with telemedicine, and this is not what I would have expected to have seen, is that we have actually increased or maintained our satisfaction depending upon the comparison pool that we're comparing ourselves to. So it, it's, it's, it's good for the pocket, that is financially, it's good for patients, and some of our faculty who couldn't otherwise 
come to clinic because of various reasons, it was good for them as well. Well, don't think it was just in the clinical realm. If we had a stimulus like, uh, God forbid, like COVID, all the time, we'd have an amazing surge in our research portfolio. We've had 21 grants submitted from the Department of Medicine alone because of COVID or COVID-based. 62% of them have been from ID, 29% from pulmonary, and 9% from general medicine. And there's more that can happen and are happening as, as we speak. So these are very significant diff, uh, opportunities that have been taken. In order to have, uh, allow ourselves to take advantage of these opportunities, we were able to get two new spaces, clinical spaces, for the Department of Medicine that will enable us to perform research as well as take care of patients. First, there's a building, if you look on your right, at 1425 Northwest Avenue. You probably pass it on the way to work. It, it, this is a Google map of it. It's, it's behind the Neurology Research Building on the way to Jackson. And there are 10 new exam rooms that are going to be um, designed for use of COVID positive patients. That will be for either clinical trials, research, or for clinics that need to see patients that are known to be COVID positive with all the bells and whistles that you need with negative pressure, et cetera. In addition to that, on the first floor of the Converge building is the first step into invasion of that building where we have uh, Dr. DeBlecki Lewis's vaccine trial and others for primarily COVID negative patients will go there. And so we have, uh, and, and so along with getting the, the, the grants, we have the space and we have the permission to hire the individuals necessary to do that work. Is it perfect? Not yet, but we're getting there. And then what comes out of research, not just grants, but the dissemination of new knowledge that is really designed to um, make sure that we uh, perpetuate our findings and what we do. And I'm not gonna go into a lot of details, but cardiology has, uh, here are six papers of cardiology just um, published in the last couple of months related to COVID. Uh, GI, digestive diseases, they have eight. The endocrinology, looking at uh, anything from diabetes to uh, drugs that affect response to COVID, six, general internal medicine, hematology, infectious diseases, and medical oncology, all are involved in, um, the, uh, in the dissemination of new knowledge that emanate here from uh, the University of Miami. In addition, nephrology and of course, pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine. In addition, there, be, there were silver linings in our educational min mission. We learned how to adapt our pedagogy for undergraduate medical education to the point where we were able to do online learning. We were able to do OSCEs and test people's clinical diagnostic skills based on, uh, based on telemedicine. Our graduate medical education program has, uh, was also uh, redesigned uh, relatively quickly, not only to provide uh, the, the appropriate education that we need to provide our residents, but also to provide um, coverage at, at Jackson and UMH uh, and the VA when needed. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and then uh, CME, well, you know, grand rounds on a good day, we were lucky to get uh, 50 to 75 people show up and three or four would look at it online. But with the advent of Zoom, uh, we have over 150 people coming to Grand Rounds. And I promise you all that Grand Rounds this coming year will be absolutely stupendous. As a matter of fact, I had it confirmed that Mario Stevenson has gotten Tony Fauci, who will be talking at Grand Rounds later this year. And we all look forward to that. So overall, in terms of our education, our efforts have really shown our ability to deliver medical education in these unprecedented times. And lastly, and this is what I want to spend a little bit of time talking about, is the so-called intangible effect that the pandemic had on our unity as a department of medicine. And it's not just faculty. 
And it's not just our residents and our learners and our fellows, but our staff as well. There isn't anybody who hasn't pitched in in some way, some form in terms of what they've done for, uh, for each other and for our patients during this time. And this is one of the things when I, I really do believe that the world is a great place and that people are basically really good because if we can respond this way under adversity and under a pandemic, I know that human nature is, is, is really very special. Now look at the, the, the facts. Unfortunately, we've had about 4% of our faculty and staff that were tested COVID positive and 6% of our residents and fellows as of uh, a couple of days ago, that was, that was the number. In order to accommodate these faculty and staff, many of whom were not symptomatic, but needed to go into isolation or quarantine, there was an amazing response. Faculty volunteered to cover the hospitalists team and the critical care units. In addition, hospitalist teams were created and staffed by moonlighting and faculty covered for colleagues who couldn't participate in direct con contact, direct care contact, whether it was on a consult service or in clinic. And not just our faculty, but in response to the increased demand for workforce needs in testing, 80 of our staff had been reassigned in order to help with the general university staff. I can't underestimate it, whether it's our intensivists that were standing on their feet for four days in a row for 12 hours or more and did it without a day off, or whether it was our hospitalists that took care of more patients, or our hemonc doctors that continued to care for patients and administer life-saving chemotherapy to a level that was even greater than it was before, our palliative care doctors, our cardiologists that went above and beyond, our gastroenterologists that came in on weekends in order to scope people that needed to have procedures done. Um, our general medicine people that covered at Jackson and, and as well as our ICU people that covered and ran Jackson. Our ID people without whom we wouldn't have made, we couldn't remdesivir, not remdesivir, tocilizumab, oh, it's out, hydroxychloroquine, oh my gosh. Without the ID people, who we, wouldn't, we would have been in the dark. So it's amazing how much and if I left out a division, it's rheumatology. Even they helped. Everybody came together. And if I left out the heme and onc and cell therapy and all of them together, I think I got you all. If I didn't, it was not because you didn't help. It's because I might have just had a, had a moment of, of memory lapse. So in addition to all those people, there are three people who I just want to mention because I think we all know who they are. But it would be remiss as us of us as a department of medicine, without whom we really couldn't have survived. Because when you think about our hospital, our hospital really fuels much of what we do. And Tanera Ferreira, I don't know if you're listening, but I love you. You're terrific. You're, you're, you're a leader, you're great. Kim Manny, a close friend who is the CEO of View Health Tower, been absolutely amazing. And Bavarth, Although I rarely see you without your mask, it's good to see what your face looks like. And I know how essential you have been day and night dealing with questions and people. So we all owe all three of you, as well as everyone else, a great deal of, of thanks and respect. So again, not to belabor the point, but you can see here on the left, Dr. Mauricio Cohn and Dr. Panacos treating a COVID patient with a PE in full PPE, so a PE and PPE for a COVID patient. We, everything was done. Dr. Abreu, I don't know which, I can guess she's the one on the right as we look at it, and Dr. Kata getting ready to scope somebody in GI. Here are more heroes, whether they're uh, individuals, Dr. Kelly and Fatty from Hospice and Palliative Medicine, and Dr. Lichtenberger filming an educational video, and Dr. Carolyn Elston, one of our nurse practitioners from medical oncology, you are all resilient and terrific. In addition, we have on the upper right, our hepatologist, Pat Jones and Carol Cottrell in the background and uh, Olvin Karaskiw on the left with his team at Jackson and our cellular therapy 
team on the lower right and our nurse practitioners, Blanco Ramirez, Vaquero, and Emocape. So without you, none of this would have been possible, not at all. So thank you, all of you. You have been an amazing group of colleagues and friends during these very, very rough times. So we've had some that have retired, and I want to pay respect to those individuals. Horst Bear, who's been a, a, a pillar of our uh, pulmonary uh, and critical care team. He still, although he says he's retired, he still comes in and does shifts, but um, he's clearly a valuable colleague and will always be so. And Matt Cooten, who retired, he was uh, head of the uh, associate CMO at the VA for medicine, close friend in the Department of Medicine, of course, very involved in ID. So we'll, uh, we respect their need to wanting to retire. We'll miss them, but we'll always be, th be thinking of them. And um, not to imply anything about the juxtaposition of the retirees and the people that, um, that, were, that left us this year uh, in another way. Uh, Dr. Jeffers, who you all recall, was a uh, prominent uh, hepatologist that was uh, in our VA practice for many years and Dr. Mintz, who was a former chair of the Department of Medicine, was uh, also uh, passed away this year. So we remember them fondly and, uh, and have only good memories of them. And, and lastly, I want to point out a very, very close friend and faculty member of the Department of Medicine, Dr. Safi. Dr. Safi died, unfortunately, a few months ago from complications of COVID. And... Um, was truly not only an inspiration as a doctor and an individual who provided an example of how it is to be so-called old-fashioned doctor, listening to the patient, going in at night and seeing them in the hospital, not, un, not, under, not appreciating boundaries between, oh, you're my clinic patient, you're calling me after five o'clock, I'm sorry I can't answer your call until tomorrow. This, he was truly a doctor's doctor, and it was really a, a, a pleasure to have uh, known Dr. Safi. In addition to that, he has been the benefactor to our research day, and his endowment, to which the research day remains named after, is all thanks to Dr. Safi. So thank you very much, Gene. We miss you, and uh, we wish you and your family uh, peace. And now comes the uh, opportunity where, after everyone deserves an award, because if I didn't mention you by name telepathically, I give you all an award. But we still have the tradition for the for many last several years of giving out different awards. So although I can't um, give you a plaque, you'll get a plaque, and um, I'll ask you to stand up wherever you are because you should know people are applauding you when your name is announced. So the first award is the Shally Research Award. God bless Dr. Shally. I don't even know how old he is, but he's our only Nobel Prize winner at the University of Miami. He's been a real friend of the Department of Medicine. He's still actively publishing, and I tell you, he's still doing research, as I have to constantly sign off on agreements for him to continue to do his research. He's an inspiration for everybody that there's no such thing as being, uh, 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 being in the business too long that you can't continue to do research. And so we've named our research award after Dr. Shally. In 2018, Josh Hare won it. And last year, Pat Jones and Alicia Fornoni uh, won it. And this year, in 2020, the Shally Research Award goes to the Professor al Qaeda and Professor Losos. We also have a Distinguished Clinician Award. In 2018, it went to Peter Hussein and Elio Dana. In 2019, it went to Dr. Alvarez, Professor Ayala, and Professor Contreras. And in 2020, the Distinguished Clinician Awards go to Lika Khalid and Dan Kett, both of whom were in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care. I should say that the Distinguished Clinician Award was voted on by the faculty and it was a vote that took place a couple of months ago uh, before COVID, and it was truly based on the, on the voting results. So please vote next year as well. 
Then there's the Diversity Award, <clears throat> excuse me, that was in 2018 given to an individual who really represented the department's main uh, objective of, cre of em embracing um, racial inclusion and embracing our mission uh, for inclusion. And uh, that went in 2018 to Dr. Rodriguez and into 2019 to uh, Dr. Tukes. And this year in 2020, we awarded to Dr. Brown. Dr. Brown as a division chief of, uh, as section chief for med peds in the division of general medicine as program director has really recruited the most diverse talent in our residency pool that one can imagine and has really been a leader in the department uh, for diversity. And we're grateful uh, for her service to the department and recognize it by giving her this diversity award. We have a Distinguished Educator Award, which really reflects what we wanna do as educators. You'll recall in 2018, Dr. Hurley won it. In 2019, we, uh, we awarded Matt M and Amar Deshpande. And in 2020, the Distinguished Educator Award goes to Michael Dial from the Department of Cardiology for Division of Cardiology for all that he has done. Uh, in developing the curriculum for cardiology and teaching the students. And Dr. Daniel Lichtstein, who has been a longtime member of the Department of Medicine and has really been the major educator at our satellite programs up at JFK. Uh, and uh, we are grateful for all that he has done for the department and really emulate uh, both of these fine individuals as uh, terrific educators. For the, in the Department of Medicine. And lastly, an award that was established by Dr. Jamie Barkin and Dr. Rogers, both ha who happen to be gastroenter gastroenterologists, but endowed the name of this, um, this uh, award uh, for outstanding mentorship. Someone who has really made a difference in the lives by training younger faculty to reach their fuller potential. And in 2018, it was Dr. Michael Kolber, and we were pleased that uh, Dean Gardner got it in 2019. And this year in 2020, the award is given to Dr. Alessia Fornoni for the many roles that she has here at the university in the uh, directorship of the Physician Scientist Program, as well as in the CAT Center for uh, Nephrology and Hypertension and the CAT Center for drug discovery, and all the individuals that she has trained. So my friends, that concludes the State of the Department Address for 2020. It's been a tough year. You've been great colleagues. And now it's time to celebrate a little bit. So thank you very much. I'm here to take any, uh, although I can't really take questions, but I certainly um, will be, I'll stay online till the last of you leave. Uh, to, uh, to hear any comments, criticisms, or whatever. So thank you very much for your participation today. Laura? I have to celebrate you, baby. I have to praise you like I should. Thank you.
Hey, Barry. Hey, Barry. You're a good friend. Thank you for staying. I don't see everybody that's on, but um, Thank you. <laughs> I wish we could dance. We could have soapy donut something. <laughs> all right. You're all the best. Thank you. Thank you for your support. We should, God willing, do this again next year with a better, more strong message of unity and everything else. Great job, Dr. Wise. Thank you, thank you. Will you save the chat so I can read it um, later because I couldn't see it during the uh, thing. Will do. Okay. Thank Hi, you. everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks, Heal it. Be well. Hi, Dr. Madison. Glory, thank you. Yelena. Stephanie! Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations, Stephanie. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we don't see people's faces much anymore. It's so nice. All right. So, do you recognize the um, song, Steph? <laughs> yes, I'm impressed by the soundtrack. <laughs> Okay, I, I, I didn't choose the music, I must say. That was Laura, but the first song I agreed to, the opening number. The second number I never heard before myself. It was, yeah, it was very appropriate. <laughs> Good. All right, everyone. Have a lovely day. Be safe, and we'll see you next week. Oh, I forgot to announce next right week is Grand Rounds again. All right, but people will know. Yeah, we'll send out an email. Okay. Great. Oh, you're going to show you one. Okay. Good. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Okay. I'm going to sign off now. Bye. Bye.